the rescue team. On the rescue team, there is no official commander. Prudence and Bear are the most senior members, and of them, Bear defers to Prudence in any matter outside of battle. But neither of them have much interest in taking field commander, per se. That's all fine. No commander is needed. Everyone in the group is of a singular mind. They've taken nearly every rope in the company. Descend the edge of the cliff all the way down. For reference, the team is Prudence, Leona, Agrippa, Bear, Kara, Hrodir, Breaker, Cass, Ignis, and Amos. Most of them have lost someone dear. Leona and Agrippa lost the third pillar of the trio. Ignis has lost Nate. Hrodir has lost Drangi. Breaker and Cass have lost two of their brothers-in-arms, a literal brother in the case of Cass and Quickly. Prudence and Bear have been with Alexander and Yorin since the beginning. Kara and Amos are there mainly due to tracking ability, stealth, and sheer stubbornness. At the bottom of the drop, they find a wide, deep river with a dangerously swift current. It takes considerable time to find any accessible side passages that are not filled with fast-flowing water, but when they do, they find an embarrassment of options. Wet but traversable passages going every direction. Kara and Amos search for tracks. They sweep up and down the passageways to little luck. But then, they have no idea how far along the river their friends may have been swept. They find a narrow passage that cleaves fairly close to the river, and begin to follow it. They follow it for a long time. The river splits, and even if they wanted to follow the other path, they have no way of crossing. So they follow the path they can. The river splits again, and again. They find themselves going down, down, down. For hours they descend, with no real assurance they're on the right track. The river opens into a small misty waterfall, and their passageway opens into a vast, enormous cavern. They find themselves high, high above the ground floor, overlooking a narrow switchback path that leads sharply down. At the bottom of the cavern they see dozens of firelights. A goblin encampment, it looks like. A huge one much larger than any of the forts they've seen thus far. They douse their own torches, hood their lanterns down to the bare minimum glimmer of light. Even with the scattered firelights, they have no visibility on the far reaches of the cavern, but they keep pushing on. As they get closer to the bottom, Prudence and Kara move ahead of the group. They find a small goblin patrol, a half dozen of them marked and scarred as followers of the old ones. They coordinate with the others. A quick, bloody ambush spells the end of the goblins. They cling to the edges of the cavern, skirting around the goblin encampment. They find another passageway out and take it. At this point, they have learned an unfortunate truth. The underpaths, and the caverns beneath it, are far larger than they could ever have guessed. The goblins far more numerous. Not only do they doubt they will ever be able to find Alexander and Yorin, they begin to doubt they can even find their way back. They decide their only chance of finding anything worthwhile is to stick to the main passageways. They will likely run afoul of more goblins that way, but if they stay hidden, they doubt they'll ever find anyone. Within a few hours of taking a wide, well-traveled passage, they hear echoing shouts ahead, and the sounds of battle. They rush forward, encouraged, seeking their allies, only to come across something else entirely. Goblins fighting goblins. They hang back, watching the fight, very nearly withdrawing entirely. But Ignis suggests that perhaps the goblins could be useful. They consider their options, and decide it's worth a try. They unleash hell upon the old one marked goblins. Arrows and crossbow bolts fly. Leona, Bear, and the two sons charge into the fray, sandwiching the old one worshippers between Steelshod and the other goblins. 
but they very nearly have to kill the other goblins too. But they pull back, trying to signal their intent. The remnants of the other goblin group had been on the losing side, already suffering heavy casualties. They watch Steelshod cautiously. They speak to each other. The goblins speak a broken pigeon of middish, but it's passable. Agrippa steps forward, giving his best attempt at channeling his placating bedside manner into a diplomatic approach. They explain that they seek their friends. They have no quarrel with anyone who does not intend to hinder them, and they will kill any goblin that stands in their way. The goblins say that their friends are likely deep in the territory of the old ones, best given up for dead. Everyone of Steelshod says in no uncertain terms that they will not leave without them, even if it means killing the old ones themselves. Very well, then. This particular goblin spokesman knows when he's in over his head. Moreover, he has an inkling that these humans could be useful. If they want help on their venture into the Old One's territory, then they must follow him. Where? To Varesh, of course. The Lost Party As soon as they are swept off the underpass road, Alexander, Yorin, Hubert, and all the others tumble into the vast, relentless river below. They are swallowed up by the fast currents, battered against rocky walls, carried downriver at near breakneck speed. At least one supply cart has gone in with them, shattering in the rocks of the fall. While most of Steelshod flounders struggling to stay above the water, Gunnar cuts through the water like a knife, fighting the current, grouping up with a few of his companions, finding floating chunks of wood to help the weaker swimmers buoy themselves. Alexander sheds a few pieces of plate, but mostly swims in his armor. His tier 10, second skin, makes moving and surviving in armor considerably easier. It likely keeps him from drowning. Still, it's a wild, brutal ride. A series of painful rolls leave many of them badly injured. They find themselves deposited off a steep waterfall, down into a vast lake. Luminescent fungi provides a faint blush glow along the walls and ceiling, and they find themselves washing up on a rocky island in the middle of this lake. Battered, semi-conscious, half-drowned, three dead horses floating nearby, soaked supplies scattered across the lake, bobbing in the water. A head count reveals they now number twelve. Alexander, Yorin, Elena, Hubert, Gunnar, Orson, Ben, Drangi, Miles, Quickly of the Sons, Tiny of the Sons, and a lone knight Serpentis named Brother Luke. Astute readers and the players themselves may note that this leaves Nate, Robin, Michelle, Levin, Dasha, and at least three Serpentes separated, unaccounted for. But none of the characters know that just yet. Everyone is hurt. Cracked bones, concussions, bleeding gashes and scrapes. Numerous other small injuries abound, but Orson and Ben are in a bad way. Orson's left hand is broken in several places, swollen, his ring finger a pulped ruin. Ben has a broken leg. It's a nasty break, just below the knee with some seemingly torn ligaments. Hubert, Elena, and Orson treat the wounded as best they can, but everyone also has to roll for what they've lost. And Orson lost half the contents of his healing bags. Elena hasn't had medical supplies of her own for some time, and Hubert's lost his entire pack. Most of his poisons, alchemical supplies, the lot save a couple of pots Yorin held on to, and whatever is still back on the supply lines with the main column. They huddle in the dim blue glow as they assess their losses. They use some oil and fragments of wet wood to start a small, smoky fire. With some chagrin, they butcher a few hunks off of one of the dead horses, as most of their rations have been lost or ruined, and they don't know how long they will be down here. They rest by the small fire, charring rare strips of horse meat. 
The lake is eerily quiet save for the steady crash of the waterfall on the far edge and the faint current lapping against the island. Yorin, who fared better than most, decides to start exploring. He swims out to the edges of the cavern and identifies a few possible exits. None are at ground level, though. Each would require a climb. He scouts them further, climbing up to the nearest cave mouth to investigate. As he climbs, he sees movement out of the corner of his eye, something above him, large, swooping past, casting flickering shadows in the strange light. Gone, when he turns to look, but he knows what he saw. It was above him. It moved fast, and it was large, at least the size of a man. They aren't alone down here. Thank you for tuning in to Steel Shod, a series by Mostly Rights, narrated by Tailforge. You can find every chapter in text format, as well as character sheets, setting information, maps, and rule documents on the Steel Shod tabletop system in the link below. If you'd like to support the channel, you can pop down to the description and use the Patreon link for recurring donations, the PayPal.me link for one-time donations, the Teespring link for shirts with the incredibly cool background art by nobody, or use the drive through RPG affiliate link the next time you're looking to try a new system. If you'd like to support the author, you can find Steel Shod merch on the MostlyWrites.com store, or donate to the Mostly Rights Patreon, which are both linked on reddit.com slash r slash mostlywrites down below.